Good morning, everyone. Uh, so last day we have discussed, we have started with biodiversity, right? We have first seen that what are the different components of biodiversity. There we have talked about genetic biodiversity, species biodiversity, and the biodiversity of ecosystem. Okay. And at the same time, like uh, when we were discussing this biodiversity, we have also seen the variation of biodiversity according to the latitude and according to the altitude. Then after we have talked about the role of biodiversity and the threats which are there for the biodiversity. Okay. We have also made that uh, diagram of climate change that how climate change is having multiple impacts on multiple things. Okay. Before that we have concluded with our ecosystem theme. We have discussed coral reefs there, mangroves there. Okay. Of course some of the current related themes of both these things mangroves as well as this uh, coral reefs are there. And we will cover it in the current updation classes. We will see it. Okay. There is mangrove alliance for climate for coral reef also. There are various technologies for its protection or conservation. So we will see it there. Okay. In the biodiversity, so far we have discussed four things. One was what is exactly biodiversity and its component, then variation, then the role. And then we have talked about the threats which are existing. The next thing that we have to see is the conservation method of biodiversity. Conservation of biodiversity. And this conservation of biodiversity in, is done in two different forms. One is what we call as in situ mode of conservation. And the other one is called as ex situ mode of conservation x to mode of conservation. Okay. So let us first understand that what is this difference between in situ and x situ. I think you already have read about this multiple times in situ and x situ. In situ simply means wherever the biodiversity is present, wherever its original uh, location is, when we are trying it to conserve it in its original location, in its natural location, then that method is something which we call as in situ method of conservation. Okay. The second thing will be called as ex situ mode of conservation. Okay. Ex situ means there are certain species which are threatened to a very high degree. Threatened to a very high degree means they cannot be conserved or they cannot be safeguarded in their original habitat. It may happen that the threats which are existing there it may be of very high degree. Okay. Let us say that when we talk about lions Right now we have around 500 to 600 population. But if the population of the lions will be 5 or 6, then that will become a challenge for us. Okay. And in that moment of time, we cannot conserve it in its original habitat. We have to relocate them somewhere and we have to take a special safeguard for their conservation. Okay. So whenever we are transferring them, whenever we are transferring them to some other location, Okay. And then safeguarding them, that will be simply called as ex situ method of conservation. Okay. One such species which was quite much famous in this regard in last year was North River Terrapin. Now, this is one such organism which was like, uh, you can say that threatened to a very high degree in the last decade. Only about a dozen of its population was remaining in the wild. Okay. It was like around 12 or 20 uh, around population was there of the northern Indian uh, North River Terrapin or North Indian Terrapin. And it was very much difficult to conserve in its original habitat. Okay. Its original habitat being brackish or saline water. Okay. Sometimes it also moves along the uh, land areas. But this North River Terrapin, Northern River Terrapin, it was highly threatened, having around 12 to 20 population only, 12 to 20 members only. At that moment of time, it was captured from the wild and then its captive breeding was done. By the method of captive breeding, now we have more than around 300 to 400 North River Terrapin. And they have again been released into the wild. They have again last year, I think uh, perhaps in 2022, March or April, this was there in the news 
Northern River Terrapin. And this has again been released into the wild. Okay. So it is still threatened, but now the population is slightly higher. At that time, its population was something around 12 to 20. But now its population is more than 300 to 400. Okay. So this is what we try to do in ex situ mode of conservation. It is not simply that we have to keep them in uh, any uh, national, uh, sorry, any zoo, zoological gardens or botanical gardens or anything. Our main motive in ex situ conservation is to safeguard them and increase their population. We don't, yes, we are coming to that. When we are talking about this ex situ method of conservation, we are first capturing them, relocating them to a safe site. And then we are enabling that environment where they can breed, where they can reproduce and produce more fertile offspring. We provide them the right condition, we provide them the security so that can, when the organisms are having all their requirements made, then what they will do, they will go for further reproduction and production of the fertile offspring. Okay. So we are enabling them that environment where they can reproduce and increase their population. If their population becomes viable again, then we allow them to move again into the wild. So here what we have focused on, we have focused on captive breeding. Means they are allowed to reproduce but in a controlled environment, in a safe guarded environment. That is the main motto of XC2 method. Okay. We allow this captive breeding or we try to enable this captive breeding. Okay. This thing doesn't happen in NC2 method. Here we are also trying to do one thing. We are also trying to one work on the gene pool. Okay. In most of the ex situ methods and in many of them, you will find that not all of them, but in many of them, you will find that we are also studying their genes. Okay. We are also working on their genes, how they can become more disease resistant or what unique properties they are having. All these things are calculated there. Okay. So gene pool conservation or other Related things are also done in case of XC2 method. Okay. So here one more thing we do. Gene pool conservation. Okay. This is something which we work in case of XC2 method. We also try to read about their, uh, like uh, you will find that various plants and animals are there. Their uh, sperm or their egg cells have been like uh, taken out and it has been you can say that uh, it has been saved at cryogenic temperature where they have been freezed and they can be stored for longer period of time so that in future if the organisms become extinct then with the help of their fertilized egg or with the help of their sex cells we can re-enable them we can bring them back into the environment okay. so this is also something which is done in xc2 method this is also like normally ex situ methods were generally related with zoological gardens, botanical gardens or other things. But in case of ex situ methods, even the genes are taken out of the body and they are also conserved. That is also part of ex situ method. Okay. Their uh, seeds are, seeds of the plants are taken out. Okay. We have various seed vaults here also. We call it as seed vault. seed vault where the seeds of various plants like you know that in India we have different types of rice, we have different types of mango, we have different types of mangroves, we have different types of plants. Okay. So what we are taking, what we are doing, we are conserving the seeds of these plants and we are storing them at very low temperature so that they can remain there in dormant stage and in the future if suppose some of these organisms are extinct we can reintroduce them back into the environment. So this is one such thing which we are doing in case of XC2 method. Clear? Then when we talk about in C2 method, here you have examples like uh, the old one examples like zoological gardens, botanical, botanical gardens, but new ones are like seed vaults. Okay. Seed vaults or seed banks, they are considered as new examples of XC2 method of conservation. Okay. Now in the case of in C2 method, what we are doing, we are not relocating them. Okay. We are not like moving them to some place else. What we are doing, we are just trying to like conserve them in their original habitat. Okay. 
we are not moving them someplace else. We are not like trying to, uh, let us say that if there is a forest area and it will be a habitat for a large number of organisms. So we are not moving them, rather than that, we are safeguarding the entire habitat so that the organisms there will automatically be conserved. Let us say that if there is a forest and in the forest there are multiple organisms living, we know that ecosystem exists in equilibrium. Okay. So if there is no such threat to them, they will be automatically conserving themselves. So in in situ methods, what we are doing, we are simply removing away those disturbances which are happening to the ecosystem. Okay. We are enabling them to conserve in their original habitat. In original habitat. Now see this. Recently, think about this. Like recently, we have reintroduction of African cheetah from Namibia to Kuno National Park in Madhya Pradesh. Okay, this was a thing which was like uh, going on for multiple decades. Now it has been reintroduced. So, will you count that as in situ method of conservation? This you cannot classify as in situ or ex situ method of conservation. Okay. This is a simply reintroduction program. This is not a conservation program. First of all, what we are doing, we are not conserving, like we had to conserve Asiatic cheetah. There we failed. Asiatic cheetah are extinct by now. Now you are introducing some other species. So you are not introducing them for conserving them. You are simply introducing them so that now their population can grow in that area. You have found that this location is suitable for their growth and you want cheetah to be there in India. So you have just introduced it. It cannot be calculated as a part of ex situ method or in situ methods. Okay. There was no such need for conservation of African cheetah. Okay. It was already there in good number. There was no such need to reintroduce them to somewhere else. So it cannot be counted as in situ or ex situ method. It is simply a reintroduction program of some organism. Okay. So it is not in situ or ex situ. Clear? In in situ what we are doing, we are making certain protected areas. Like we are having a list of them. We are conserving them in their original habitat. How we are conserving them? Like suppose that we can have certain areas which can be designated as protected areas in form of national park, wildlife sanctuary, then we can also have biosphere reserve. We can also have this uh, community reserve. Conservation reserve. We also have sacred groves. Then we also have Ramsar sites. We also have tiger reserve or elephant reserve, but they are not such like protected areas in this manner. Okay. Basically, whenever you will find tiger reserves or anything, they are not a sort of protected area in such regard. They are simply, a, you can say a project in that manner. Okay. Tiger reserve is not carved out of like a, a plain area. Tiger reserve is already a higher level designation to priorly existing national parks or wildlife sanctuary. So here we do not do anything new. We do not carve out a new area and then we like uh, name it as tiger reserve. Okay. So let us see first of all these in situ methods of conservation. What are they and how they are different from each other. Okay. This is something which you have to know. Okay. Now let us first see the difference between three things. National park wildlife century and biosphere reserve. Okay. See, in 19, till 1972, 
we were having certain forest areas which were protected okay like you know that when the britishers came to india they also have sort of reserved forest or protected forest okay now their aim of declaration of reserved forest or protected forest was not for the terms of conservation of the biodiversity rather than that it was for economic purposes okay in reserved forests they were not allowing the indian people or the tribal people to go inside why they were not allowing they think that the plants which are there the ones which they were growing it was good for making the ships making the railway tracks or for construction activities okay so they wanted that dominance or they wanted that control ownership over those reserved forest okay in protected forest tribal which were allowed to go and uh, they were allowed to collect minor forest produce some grasses some branches of the trees and other things there also they were having some trees of economical value but it was not so much significant okay so reserved forest was exclusively uh, used by the britishers in the protected forest the indians were allowed to collect the minor forest produce whereas some open forest were also there where people can easily leave okay and they can easily collect their required things okay so this was not done for conservation this was simply done for meeting their economic needs when in 1972 by like uh, this end of this world war and everything was over by that time it was also realized that the biodiversity is getting lost at a huge rate okay right now also we can see that around 515 species on the terrestrial ecosystem are on the verge of extinction and we are not talking about the small insects we are talking about the vertebrates those who have a proper spinal cord out of the 30000 like large vertebrates which are there on the surface of terrestrial ecosystem on the surface of land not aquatic ecosystem just the terrestrial ecosystem out of the 30000 which has been analyzed around 515 are there more than 500 are there which are on the verge of extinction in the upcoming decades okay so many of them have become extinct also and many of them are on the verge of extinction so a large number of species are getting lost okay now by the 1972 the governments of worlds have come to an agreement that we have to safeguard the environment we have to safeguard the biodiversity and we have to take various measures okay in light of that india also became a party to this and india has made a law which was by the name of wildlife protection act 1972 okay under that wildlife protection act 1972 certain areas were identified for the conservation of biodiversity for the conservation of the life forms uh, wildlife as well as vegetation okay and in that itself we got certain areas okay the two of them were national park and wildlife sanctuary they all have been formed under the provisions of wildlife protection act 1972 so this is one sort of similarity between them okay they all have been these two have been formed under the provisions of wildlife protection act 1972 now this national park and wildlife sanctuary who can declare it in terms of declaration in both these cases the state government as well as the central government is allowed to declare them uh, declare an area as a national park or a wildlife sanctuary okay so both of them can do this primarily it is done by the state government only because you know that the land is owned by the state government land is a state subject okay land is owned by the state government only okay so they have this control over all these things and that's why both state and central government state and union can declare here also the same thing okay state and union can declare so these are first the legal provisions about them okay let us come to further more things like why they are declared what is the main motive behind declaration of an area as a wildlife sanctuary or a national park okay now normally wildlife sanctuary as you can see in the name itself it is related to wildlife but you cannot conserve the wildlife until unless the habitat is conserved you cannot conserve a tiger in the road side or in the urban area you have to provide a proper habitat for that okay so in both the cases wildlife as well as the habitat means the forest the vegetation 
both of them are conserved you cannot conserve the tiger without the forest you cannot conserve the deer without the forest okay so if you have to conserve any animal you have to conserve their habitat also so for protection of both of them are given in any case okay now this when we talk about the wildlife sanctuary there is a normal convention that suppose that there is a particular area now this is a convention this is not something which is given in the law in the law it is simply that if you have to conserve certain wildlife and the flora and fauna in that area if you have to conserve flora and fauna in that area you can declare it as a wildlife sanctuary it is as simple as that they have not given a distinction that you can declare it only for conservation of a animal okay it is as simple as that if you have to protect an area if you have to conserve an area its flora and fauna then you can simply declare it as a wildlife sanctuary but as a convention suppose that there is an area there is a forest and it is particular for it is particularly famous for a special type of wildlife let us say that um, uh, let us say that it is famous for snow leopard okay let us say an area is there and it is famous for snow leopard and now you have to conserve that area or you have to conserve that particular organism so for the purpose of conservation of that particular organism also you can declare that area as a wildlife sanctuary okay so originally with law there is no such thing that you have to do it for animals you can do it simply for flora and fauna but conventionally okay it is being done for conservation of some specific species okay so conventionally you can see here for protection of certain species of wildlife okay here also we have protection of both flora and fauna okay so conventionally it is done for protection of certain wildlife species but you cannot uh, protect a wildlife species without conserving its habitat so you have to do both the things protection of flora and fauna now when we talk about national park in this regard generally when you have to provide for a higher degree of protection when you have to conserve that area in a very strict manner okay the entire habitat the entire vegetation all the species in a very strict manner then generally it is declared as a national park many a times it will also happen that suppose you have already declared an area as a wildlife sanctuary and you want greater protection there you can upgrade it in form of a national park okay so upgradation of wildlife sanctuary can also be done in form of national park or simply an area can be protected in a very strict manner for conservation of flora and fauna flora and fauna the wildlife sanctuary can be upgraded to national park okay so this is one more thing which you have to keep in mind the wildlife sanctuary can be upgraded to a national park okay whereas protection of both flora and fauna is done in both the ecosystem here also you will have protection of flora and fauna here also okay so this is something which is done on the basis of convention okay now a few more things about them when we are talking about this national park and wildlife sanctuary let us see that how they are more different from each other okay. when a state government or a central government is trying to declare a national park they have to you can say that notify the boundaries of the national park in a proper manner okay so here boundaries are notified by legislation okay here boundaries are notified by 
notified by legislation so proper in the law itself suppose you have to uh, notify the boundaries of a national park in the notification of that national park itself it will be properly mentioned that what will be the length and breadth of this national park what will be the area what will be the landmarks where it is existing each and everything like suppose when you are purchasing a land then all the things are properly done on paper in the similar manner the boundaries of a national park are properly given it is not that from this a point to that point it will be a national park from this river to that river this will be a national park no here the boundaries are fixed and notified by a proper legislation okay but in this case of wildlife sanctuary in the case of wildlife sanctuary we don't have such proper fixing of boundary by legislation okay boundaries are given between boundaries are given between geographical landmarks for example it can be simply done that from river a to river b in the east and in the west like suppose two rivers are there just for an example these are the two rivers okay let us say that this is the east side and this is the west side and here we have certain mountain range or certain things certain other geographical features so we can simply denote that from this river in the east to this river in the west from this river in north or this feature in north to this feature in south this area will be called as a wildlife sanctuary okay so here the boundaries are not properly fixed okay and that's why there is no such strict fencing or anything around this wildlife sanctuary okay in case of national park also you can't have fencing around the entire area but the areas are properly fixed okay but in case of wildlife sanctuary there is no such fixing of the area suppose there is a mountain range and it is having huge forest and other things you can simply say that the forest around this particular peak will be a wildlife sanctuary done okay the forest between this valley to that valley will be a wildlife sanctuary done okay so this is simply between the different geographical landmarks okay this is done between different geographical landmarks and there is no such fixing of boundary as such there is no such notification of boundary by legislation okay so here boundaries are completely fixed here the boundaries will be a little bit variable that is a major difference between a national park and wildlife sanctuary okay then further if you see here in case of a national park we find that in case of a national park we find that grazing is not allowed okay it is strictly mentioned in the law itself that grazing is not allowed in a national park okay whereas in this may be allowed it may be allowed okay at the same time a lot of human activities like various human activities inside the national park are not allowed in general okay sometimes it can be allowed but many of the human activities are restricted okay many of the human activities like suppose if anyone has to go inside the national park they will have to take proper permission from the authorities in wildlife sanctuaries they can enter easily but in case of national park it will be considered as a offense okay so you have whenever you have to go inside the national park you have to take proper permission there okay so you can simply take in one general sense that there will be strict norms for human activities okay here strict norms for human activities activities relatively less strict norms it is not that suddenly all of a sudden you can go in wildlife sanctuaries and you can make resorts or anything okay no that is also not allowed there also you will have to take permission but it is easier to get a permission in the case of wildlife sanctuary but in case of national parks it will be relatively difficult
they can do it alone both the state government as well as national governments are empowered to declare a national uh, declare a national park or wildlife sanctuary on their own if the national if the national government or the union government is declaring an area as a wildlife sanctuary or national park then they will have to consult a little bit with the state government because land is the subject of a state a state in their power are like they have this complete power to declare an area as a national park or a wildlife sanctuary so states have more authority there okay so the state government can uh, declare any area as a national yes national government has to consult a little bit with the state government because the land is their subject okay so you need first the transfer of land of course the national government can force the state government to transfer the land so of course union government will be more powerful okay in any case but they will have to a bit consult with the state government if they want to declare an area as a wildlife sanctuary or a national park okay so declaration in the case of declaration the state government is having more power in comparison to union government okay we will come to the second part also state governments are empowered to do this declaration of an area as a wildlife sanctuary or a national park on their own they don't need any consultation with the union government at all okay but once they have declared an area as a national park or a wildlife sanctuary under the provision of wildlife protection act now they cannot denotify it or they cannot diminish the area of that particular thing okay so declaration is their ambit they can declare the area as a national park they can declare the area as a wildlife sanctuary but once they have declared it now they cannot denotify it they cannot say that now from this date onward it won't be called as a wildlife sanctuary or it won't be called as a national park their ambit is only limited to declaration okay reversal of the decision is not allowed once you have declared it you have declared it now when you want to like denotify an area first of all you will have to take the permission from national board for wildlife and national board for wildlife is chaired by the prime minister okay so ultimately whom you have to consult the union government okay so declaration can be done but denotification of the area or diminishing the area is not allowed you can add more area that is their ambit you can further expand that area you can increase the area of a national park declare more area under the national park but diminishing is not allowed okay so this is one way road for the state government state government can go on adding the national parks adding the wildlife sanctuaries but they cannot reduce this number they cannot reduce the size okay so this is one thing that will be common to both national park as well as wildlife sanctuary so one more thing there is one organization iucn international union for conservation of nature not a like a un related organization it is simply a non profit organization okay now this iucn has different classification of different habitats okay according to the level of protection according to the level of diversity and all things okay and in that they have different categories one is like very uh, if you talk about the you can if you talk about a very important area like which is very much highly conserved which is having very little interference from outside which is very well managed it is in iucn category 1 area like you have very uh, reserved type of forest or protected type of forest where no such outside influences there that will be in a category 1 area there we find that iucn ranks national park as iucn category 2 area and the wildlife sanctuary is given as iucn category 4 area okay so they have multiple classification when we will read about this iucn we will see that thing also that how they are classifying it but they have done it simply on the basis of conservation on the basis of how much well managed the areas are okay if an area like a forest is there and it is very well managed having very little interference then it is considered as the best conserved ecosystem then we have on second number national parks like area on the third number you have various wetlands and relatively lesser protected areas in the fourth number you have this wildlife sanctuaries and then gradually the other areas okay so in the iucn it is in category 2 area in iucn it is in category 4 area okay so that is the difference between national park and wildlife sanctuary in general okay 
Remember one thing, a wildlife sanctuary can be upgraded to a national park, but you cannot, it can be done by the state government also. A state government can upgrade a wildlife sanctuary to a national park, but they cannot downgrade a national park to a wildlife sanctuary. Okay. When they have to do it, they have to take the permission from one organization that is National Board for Wildlife. Okay. Our National Board for Wildlife is owned by, sorry, not owned by, chaired by the Prime Minister. Okay. It is chaired by the Prime Minister. Okay. Means the Union Government in short. So this is the difference between national park and wildlife sanctuary. We have read a lot of points. Now it has got, sorry. Let us see biosphere reserve on other uh, slide itself. Biosphere reserve. Now first, uh, understand one thing about national park and wildlife sanctuary. Both of them are done for the protection of flora and fauna. Conventionally, wildlife sanctuary can be done for protection of a special species, but national park is done for holistic up protection of the entire ecosystem. Okay. Both can be declared by state government as well as national government. Okay. State government can declare it, but it cannot reduce the size, it cannot denotify. Okay. So that is something which you have to keep in mind. In the case of wildlife sanctuaries, many things are allowed to be done. And one more thing, many things are allowed to be done, that is true, but at the same time, there can be restriction from one wildlife sanctuary to another wildlife sanctuary. Okay. There is one such person in each state by the name of Chief Wildlife Warden. Okay. One person is designated as Chief Wildlife Warden, generally uh, IFS officer, and these officers are having the right to allow certain activities or not to allow certain activities within the wildlife sanctuaries or national park. Okay. If they have to allow certain thing in the national park, they have to go through the rules which has been, been given by the Wildlife Protection Act. In case of wildlife sanctuary, they have greater flexibility, but in case of national parks, they have very less flexibility. Okay. So just understand one thing. In case of national parks, we have a strict norms. In case of wildlife centuries, we have relatively lesser strict norms. That is the main crux of it. Okay. Now, these all has been done. These two have been done under the, protect, under the Act of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. The next thing is Biosphere Reserve. Okay. So Biosphere Reserve, again, this concept also started in 1980s and 1990s itself. It has been done under a program of UNESCO, okay. that is Man and Biosphere Program. Okay. It has been seen that just the national parks and wildlife sanctuaries cannot alone lead to the conservation of the entire system. Because when you are excluding the humans from the conservation process, they will never be part of it. You cannot do conservation in isolation. You have to do conservation in a sustainable manner by taking an inclusive approach. The conservation of organisms cannot be done in an isolation phase or isolation uh, system. Okay. It isolated system, it cannot be done. But in case if we include the humans there in the conservation process, it can be very well managed. Okay. Ultimately, the humans, they can also be helpful for conservation of the entire ecosystem if they are getting some benefit out of it. If you tell the people that if you clean the water, if you clean the river, you will be rewarded. Just give them salary of 10,000 rupees per month for conservation of any river. You will find that the river will be as fresh as anything else. Just give the people some money for that. They will conserve it. Okay. Like they should get some benefit out of it. Only then they will be very much inclined towards its conservation. Okay. Now, same approach is done in case of biosphere reserve also. You cannot save our entire ecosystem without giving some incentive to the humans also. And without them, you cannot conserve it. And people have been living in the forest since ages. Okay. The, there are various people who have been living inside the forest for ages. Now, when you exclude them out of those forest areas, they will generally revolt also. A large number of people have been living in the areas which have been now declared as a national park or a wildlife sanctuary. Okay. So what about them? They would have to be relocated outside the areas. Okay. And that is a problem. So biosphere reserve is a concept which integrates the human along with the conservation of ecosystem. Okay. 
So in case of biosphere reserve, what we do? Suppose this is an area which we have to conserve. We must we first find out what are the areas that needs greater level of protection. Okay. What are the areas which needs higher level of protection? If you see a forest, it's not like the outer areas have the same diversity and the inner areas have the same diversity. There is difference in the diversity of different part of a ecosystem. Okay. So suppose this is the area where greater biodiversity is there and even a little bit outside influence is detrimental. You have to protect this area. Okay. So this area is declared as core zone. Okay. But core zone is having a lot of biodiversity. It is having a lot of resources. Now, in the adjoining area of core regions also, you will have some biodiversity. You will have some benefit in the adjoining area also. Okay. And this is one area where we can allow certain activities of the humans, but it should not be in such a manner that the activities here start impacting the core zone. Okay. We can allow certain activities here, but it should not be in such a manner that it starts harming this area itself. So here, this is called as buffer zone. And the last area where more activities are allowed, where we allow the settlements and all, this is called as transition zone. Now see, here, this area needs utmost level of protection. Okay. Here, a little bit outside influence can be detrimental for the entire biodiversity. So we do not allow any of the human activities inside here. So human activity is not permitted. Human activities are restricted. Okay. Some research and monitoring things may be allowed, but that is the only thing. Research and monitoring. This is the only thing which can be allowed between within the core zone. Okay. This is the only thing which can be allowed within the core zone. Now, when we talk about the buffer zone, this is the area where certain types of activities can be allowed. Okay. Like sustainable agriculture. Sustainable agriculture grazing, fishing, okay. tourism and recreation. Of course, research and monitoring can also be allowed here. Okay. So these are the certain things which are allowed in the case of buffer zone. Okay. This buffer zone, see it, only those activities will be permitted, which, does, which doesn't have a large detrimental impact on the core zone. Okay. This buffer zone is acting as a shock absorber. Okay. If any shock is coming from outside, it is just there to absorb it. Okay. So this is a zone where you allow certain activities like grazing is also allowed, fishing is also allowed, sustainable agriculture is allowed. Here you won't have chemical fertilizers and other things. Okay. Here you have to go for sustainable agriculture, which is not harming them. You can go for organic agriculture. You can go for tourism and recreation activities, but you cannot uh, establish resorts here. Okay. So this is one such area. And then here in the outer zone, you can have human settlements. Okay. You can have human settlements. You can have setup of commercial activities. This is something which is done in different part of biosphere reserve. Okay. The main concept is you have to mix the human in the process of biodiversity conservation. Okay. Is there any act for it which allows for it? The answer is no. Okay. It is simply done by the state government or the union government. It can simply be declared by a state government or a union government. The UNESCO Man and Biosphere Reserve recognizes certain area as 
biosphere reserves at international level. Okay. In India, we have total a network of 18 biosphere reserves and out of that, 12 of them are recognized by the UNESCO. Okay. The latest one being Panna Biosphere Reserve in Madhya Pradesh. Okay. This is the latest inclusion in the UNESCO network. Okay. This is the latest inclusion in the UNESCO network. Panna Biosphere Reserve. Okay. Now, this is one such thing. Okay. Now the question is, is there any criteria for declaring an area to be a biosphere reserve? Yes, there are certain categories. Uh, criteria. Okay. First of all, when we are talking about a biosphere reserve, one major criteria is that one major criteria is that there should be a proper authority. Like suppose if UNESCO is recognizing an area as a biosphere reserve at international level, there should be a proper management authority. There should be a proper management authority which is working for its conservation, okay. which is overlooking the conservation of this entire biosphere reserve. Okay. So that should be working in a proper manner. Second thing is, so biosphere reserve think just see here biosphere reserve would have a proper management authority each and every biosphere reserve they will have a proper management authority which will be overlooking the sustainable development and the conservation of biodiversity within this region okay second thing is it must have this core zone must be a biogeographical unit We can say that a large or a sustainable, a sustainable biogeographical unit, core zone. Means it should not be that, like you have simply uh, like taken out a ecosystem out of nowhere and you have declared that as a core zone. Okay. That core zone should be able to maintain itself, like it should be a proper biogeographical unit. Like suppose you cannot declare Delhi as a biosphere reserve. Okay. It is not having such core zone or anything like that where all the things are in proper manner. Uh, it doesn't need any outside influence or other things. Okay. You know that when we are having a complete ecosystem, we know that ecosystem is able to self-regulate and self-maintain itself without outside influence. Okay. So it should be in such a manner, the core zone should be in such a manner that even without outside interference, it will be able to sustain itself. Okay. So that is one thing which must be incorporated here. That is something which we have to keep in mind. That core zone should be self-sustainable in that manner. It should be a unit which can function in isolation also. Okay. That is one thing. Okay. Then involvement of community and participation of tribals. Okay. So there must be participation of tribals in this entire biosphere reserve and at the same time involvement of community in involvement of community in conservation of in conservation process of biosphere reserve okay so they must be incorporated there it's not that one person sitting in a office at somewhere else will make a plan that how the biosphere reserve can be conserved you must take the local inputs you must take the traditional methods that how the biosphere needs to be conserved how they can be actually developed here okay so Tribals have also to be participated and second thing is the local community must be taken into consideration in the designation of entire area as a biosphere reserve, okay, in the management of the entire biosphere reserve. So see this, the main motto was involvement of the people in conservation process, 
Involvement of people cannot be done by a top-down approach. It has to be taken by a bottom-up approach. Okay. So this is again one thing about biosphere reserve. It is not a top-down approach. Like in case of national park, we do not ask the people that whether we should declare this is a national park or not. We simply pass a legislation from this day onward, this will be a national park. Okay. But biosphere reserve cannot be done in that manner. When you have to declare a biosphere reserve, you have to take a bottom-up approach. Then only it can be recognized as a UNESCO approved biosphere reserve. Okay. So see, we have 18 biosphere reserves so far and 12 have been recognized. Means 12 of them are meeting these criteria. If the others are not meeting the criteria, they won't be designated. Okay. So this is again something which you have to keep in case of biosphere reserve. Okay. Clear? Biosphere reserve? Now. So we have first discussed these three things, National Park, Wildlife Century and Biosphere Reserve. Now two more things are there, Community Reserve and Conservation Reserve. Okay. Let us see them. When we are talking about and Conservation Reserve, see. Community reserve and conservation reserves act as a buffer zone, acts as a buffer zone or as act as a corridor for wildlife movement. Okay. The main purpose is buffer zone or corridor for movement of wildlife. That is their main purpose. Suppose that we have declared an area as a national park and just across that national parks, we have set up chemical industries. Will that national park be sustainable? The answer is no. Okay. So when you are setting up a national park, even the adjoining areas has to be preserved. It has to be also be conserved in some manner. It cannot be having chemical units there. Okay. So this community reserve or conservation reserves both are designed in order to act as a buffer zone or a corridor for movement of wildlife. In various states, like if you go in the northeastern states, we are having 70 to 80 percent of the land under the forest zone. Okay. Around more than 80 percent of land in certain states are under the forest areas. Okay. Now, whenever you are declaring a national park, you are not declaring the entire state as a national park. You are declaring some portion of it as a national park. Now. Will the animals migrate from one national park to other national park or not? They will also migrate. There will be continuous migration of species from one area to another area. Okay. Especially you can see that there is migration of animals from one state to another state. Here we are simply talking about one area to another area. Okay. So from one national park to other national park, they can easily move. And for that movement, we require a particular corridor which can be also a safe corridor. Okay. Like let us say that this is our forest area. Here we have one national park. Here we have another national park. The animals need to move from here to here. Okay. So the zone which is here, it also has to be protected. Okay. And this corridor which is there, it can be declared as a community reserve or a conservation reserve. So either for creating a corridor or creating a buffer zone, like creating an additional buffer zone around this national park. Okay. So for that purpose, we are having a community reserve or a conservation reserve. Now, if the work is same, why we are having two different names? If the motive is same, then why we are having two different names? See, here. this community reserve and conservation reserve can be declared only by state government and why you have to keep this in mind there is a reason behind it from last year itself there is a bill proposed in the parliament for change in the wildlife protection act 1972 and biological diversity act 2002 okay there is a bill which is already pending in the parliament it has been passed by the lok sabha but rajya sabha has not passed it so far under that proposed bill, the central government has done an amendment and it has proposed that community reserve and conservation reserve 
should also be declared by central government. So they are trying to bring a new change here. So the original thing you must know till now. Okay. The original thing is only the state government has been empowered to declare an area as a conservation reserve or community reserve so far till this date. If next day the parliament passes, that is another thing. But till date, what we are having on ground, state government is the only authority which can pass an area as a community reserve or a conservation reserve. Only the state governments are empowered. Okay. Now, so work here is same, state government declaration is also same. Okay. Now the third thing, how they are different. Okay. See, if the area which is to be declared as a buffer zone or a corridor is owned by the private individuals, if it is owned by the community, like the tribal people have a sense of community land also, or they are having private lands also. So if it is a private land or community land, then the area will be called as community reserve. Okay. And if the land is owned by the government, if the area is owned by the, owned by the government, then it will be called as conservation reserve. So this is a remarkable thing between these two. In the case of community reserve, the land is actually owned by the private individuals or it is a community land of the tribal people. Okay. The second thing is, in the case of conservation reserve, the area is owned by the government. Okay. Now you may think that what if it is partially owned by the government and partially by the community or the private land? In that case, the government will purchase the land and then they will make it as a conservation reserve. Okay. If there is some condition like, let us say that 70% area is owned by the government and 30% is owned by the people. They have two opportunities there. One, what they can do, they can declare the 70% area as a conservation reserve and remaining 30 as community reserve. Or if the people agree, the government will purchase the land itself and then they will set up the entire area as a conservation reserve. Okay. So it is something which happens at ground level. This is not something which is uh, which we have to look at national level that how it will be done in different cases. If suppose 1000 acres of land is there and 2 acres of land is belonging to an individual, of course the government will purchase it. Okay. So what will happen here? If the land is of government, it is conservation reserve. If it is of private land and community land, then community reserve. Done only by a state government so far. Okay. So this is again two areas. Where it is coming from? Is there any act in its background? The answer is yes. Here also we have one single act. Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Okay. This was amended in the first decade of 2021st century. 2006 perhaps. Okay. So it was amended there and then after we have introduced this concept of community reserve and conservation reserve. Okay. So this is again a part of Wildlife Protection Act itself. Okay. Right now again a amendment is in order, amendment is already in its process. Maybe by the end of this budget session or by the time of May or June there will be some amendment. If there is something like that, I will update that in the case of current affair classes. There are going to be some changes there, but now it is in bill stage. So we don't have to look for the provisions of bill. Bill is something which is subject to change. So we don't have to look at it. Okay. We have to wait for it to be passed by the parliament, notified by the president, sorry, uh, approved by the president, notified in the gadget, then only it comes into picture. Okay. So let's wait till then. Okay. This is another two area. National Park, Wildlife Century, Biosphere Reserve, Community Reserve, Conservation Reserve. Now, the another one is Sacred Groves. See, when we are talking about Sacred Groves, there is no law about it. Okay. This is a approach of the community in order to safeguard the biodiversity and the forest. The forest and the wildlife around them. Various people have the sense that the forest or the wildlife are an integral part of their culture. Okay. There are sometimes forest areas around some temples, around some ponds, around some lakes, 
around simply it can be simply a forest in the middle of anything okay so this is a community approach of conservation this is a community approach this is due to traditional belief this is a community approach a traditional uh, it is based on traditional belief no lodge no provisions okay this is entirely managed by entirely managed by the community this is something which is entirely managed by the community so there is no such thing that uh, there will be any law or any provision for it. There is no such uh, common thing that in sacred groves this will be allowed or that will be allowed. There is no provision. It varies from place to place. It is done entirely by the community and each community has their own rules and regulation. So we cannot exactly read that what are the things which are done here. Okay. It is simply that it has been seen in many of the cases they do not even allow the people to enter into the sacred groves. Okay. Sometimes they can be allowed, sometimes people can be allowed, but normally if the community is of a, having a strong belief system, they will not even allow anyone to enter inside the sacred groves. This is considered as a part of their tradition, culture. Okay. So this is something which is not government led, it is community led thing. And that's why I have written no laws, no provisions. Okay. So if they give you or trick you in, in any form, you have to eliminate that. Okay. There cannot be a law or any provision that will be uniform for all the community. It is going to be different for all of them. Okay. So that is our sacred groups. Then what was the next one? Ramsar site. Ramsar site or simple wetland. Okay. There is a Ramsar convention and according to that convention, they have given a very broad definition of wetland. Okay. So what is according to their definition a wetland? What according to their definition is a wetland? Let us see that. They say that a wetland is an area of permanent or temporary water so first thing is water can be permanent here permanent or temporary water okay permanent or temporary water body second thing is they have said that it can be a static water or flowing So a static pond type of ecosystem or a flowing, like let us say river streams which are there, they can also be counted as a part of wetland. Okay. It can be a fresh ecosystem. It can be a saline ecosystem. It can be a brackish water ecosystem. Okay. So it is a permanent or temporary water body. It is a static or flowing. It is fresh saline or brackish. It includes Pitland, marsh, fen, swamp, etc. Okay. So even the swampy or marshy areas, like the you have, um, you will find that swampy areas are there uh, having some bushes. Then marshy areas are there having some large trees and other things. So all these areas, okay, pitlands are there where the vegetation is mostly rotting. Okay, anaerobic respiration is there. Okay. Simply fanes are also there having similar conditions, okay. more having land and less having water. All these conditions, all these types of ecosystem, they are also included to be a part of wetland. Then it can also be a coastal area, the depth of which doesn't exceed 6 meters at high tide.
the depth of sorry uh, at low tide okay it can be simply a coastal area also okay where the depth is not more than you know that during the high tides the depth can be actually higher okay but high tide is for a very small moment of time okay and during the low tide if the depth is not increasing 6 meter then it will be considered as a wetland okay then it can be natural or artificial okay so they have given all these conditions that a wetland is an area of permanent a wetland is a permanent or temporary water body it can be static or flowing it can be fresh saline or brackish it can contain pitland marsh fen swamp it can also contain coarse coastal area the depth of which should not be exceeding 6 meter at low tide and it can be a natural or a artificial site okay so basically all the areas which are containing water except the coastal area is having more than 6 meter uh, depth at low tide all the areas which are containing some form of water they have declared it as a wetland okay so their definition is very broad okay ramsar has given this broader definition of wetland okay and according to them this is the area of wetland okay but then our government has also come up with some definition of the wetlands okay you cannot include all the things here they have included the artificial by that by that simple logic even the swimming pools will be counted as a wetland so, or any resort which has been created for recreational activities that can also be considered as a wetland. Okay. So, our government has also come up with a little bit narrow definition okay, of wetland. They say that all these conditions are true. All these conditions will apply except here we are talking about Indian. sorry uh, they have wetland rules management uh, wetland management rules have been given in 2011 according to that okay so here they have defined wetland as a ramsar uh, type of wetland except paddy fields so paddy fields have been excluded river streams they have been included okay sites for artificial sites salt production artificial site for recreation activities So they have given certain limitations like paddy fields won't be counted, river streams and channels won't be counted, artificial salt, uh, sites for salt production that won't be counted, artificial site for recreation activities they won't be counted as a wetland. Okay. So these see these things they have mentioned here that artificial sites for salt production or artificial sites for recreation activities they won't be counted as a wetland. The paddy fields won't be counted as a wetland. Okay. The river streams, they won't be counted as a wetland. Okay. Why the government has come up with these things? The simple thing is, if an area is a wetland, certain rules will be applicable here. Okay. Like you cannot add chemicals or fertilizers there. But in case of paddy fields, you have to add chemical fertilizers for more production. Okay. So in some cases, they have given some exception. They say that all these conditions apply except these things okay so that is the difference between ramsar site of wetland and then indian site okay clear in the case of ramsar how many sites we have got there were good times there were like uh, simple times when we were having around 26 ramsar sites way back in 2016 17 that was the time when you can remember all the ramsar sites now we have got 75 Ramsar sites in India. So you cannot even think about remembering all the Ramsar sites. Okay. Now, some of them 
have been there in the news for certain purposes and that we will look in the current updation classes okay but a ramsar site or when we are talking about this ramsar convention okay they are designating certain areas certain wetlands of international importance okay under the ramsar convention if there is a wetland in an area and if it is of very high ecological importance it can be recognized simply as a ramsar site okay so ramsar site in simple manner are wetlands of ecological importance importance okay so that is a very important thing which you have to keep in mind wetlands of ecological importance okay then this is one point okay ramsar site around 75 sites are there in india but there is also a part under this and that is what we called as montreux record okay two sites of india are there still in montreux record okay earlier three sites were there chilika lake was there loktak lake was there and kerala dev ghana national park was also there but right now two are there one is simply on loktak lake and the second one is and second is loktak okay so these two are the montreux sites in india means these are important ramsar sites but at the same time they are facing high level of threat okay so these will be considered as part of montreux record okay so they can simply ask what is this montreux record in the ramsar convention it means these are the wetlands these are which are threatened which are facing facing huge threats yeah so montrex records it means wetlands face wetlands which are facing huge threats okay and these wetlands are also part of ramsar site okay under the ramsar site itself we have this montrex record where you have wetlands which are facing huge threats okay india we have two first uh, earlier chilika national park was also there chilika wetland was also there okay but now it has been removed because of good practices that has been adapt adopted there in order to conserve the wetland okay so now it is a better conserved wetland that's why it has been removed from the montrex record right now we are having two sites okay so this is ramsar site now the last one was tiger reserve but before we go into this tiger reserve let us uh, see one more thing while we are talking about wetlands let us see their function what functions they are performing okay when we are talking about the functions of the wetlands there you can see that first of all the wetlands are important source of important source of water okay in the wetlands we have conservation of water during the rainfall and thus they becomes an important source of water for the humans also for the human settlements also for the other parts of biodiversity also so important source of water then second thing it also helps in ground water recharge it also helps in ground water recharge okay you know that in the majority of these uh, wetlands the water is there for a longer period of time like uh, major wetlands if you find they are having huge amount of water for a large period of time and this allows the water to percolate into the ground and recharge the ground water okay so recharge of ground water is another important feature of wetlands okay then purification of water purification of water the wetlands are wetlands you can um, if we are talking about the wetlands you can say that they are having a lot of uh, a messy type of ecosystem they are not simply like you will find very beautiful flowers there or very beautifully colored uh, vegetation there 
many of the wetlands you will find that it is having a messy type of vegetation having herbs shrubs and bushes many of them are rotting in the ground also but at the same time these wetlands are also having some plants they are also having some plants which can accumulate the pollutants there they feed upon the pollutants like water hyacinth is one such plant water hyacinth can be found in these areas in the wetlands and they eat upon the pollutants they remove the heavy metals from the water they remove the heavy pollutants from the water and thus it is acting as purification of water removal of pollutant removal of pollutant okay so that is another thing which is done by this okay then remember one thing while we were talking about the ecosystem this is a sort of ecotone this is a sort of ecotone it supports huge biodiversity it can also be regarded as a zone of evolution of new species okay it can also be considered as a zone of evolution of new species okay it has a role for tourism also like uh, it's not that all the wetlands are having that same uh, mishelo you can also find there are very important wetlands like uh, if you go to uh, bhopal you have this bhoj bhoj wetland or if you go to this area of uh, chandigarh you have uh, sukhna lake is there okay so all these areas are very important from in terms of recreation and tourism you can take the example of loktak lake itself you can talk about the chelika wetland these are the areas having huge tourism potential huge recreation potential okay so economic benefit is also there from the wetlands okay now so these are some important areas you can also link it with food security for that matter it is providing a large number of fishes also it is providing a large number of other aquatic based food also to us okay so it is also a very important thing for food security okay now two things are here in the case of wetlands some of the wetlands are acting as a very important source of a very important carbon sink a majority of them are also acting as a very important carbon sink they are acting also as a carbon sink having if they are having huge vegetation like you can see the marshy areas they are having huge vegetation and they are simply acting as a carbon sink okay if you talk about the mangroves they are also a sort of wetland okay and they are a huge carbon sink that is on one side at the same time you can also link one thing they are a source of emission of methane wetlands are also a source of methane okay paddy fields in indian definition they are not counted as wetland but in actual they are a wetland and paddy fields are the major source of emission of methane okay so this is again one thing on one hand they can act as a carbon sink on the other hand they are also a source of emission of methane but that is a natural process in natural also methane has been emitted methane are getting emitted into the atmosphere but it has not led to global warming at a very fast rate so they cannot be said that they are the major contributor or they are disturbing this entire ecological uh, uh, balance okay but at this moment of time we can consider them as a source of emission of methane when we are destroying the wetlands then in that case the carbon which is stored here where it will go it will go back into the atmosphere okay so when you are destroying the wetland then it acts as a net ad net additing thing sorry net addition of carbon in the atmosphere okay so this is some role of wetland this is some roles we have not completed the entire thing okay wetlands are of huge uh, like ecological importance they are having multiple roles but these are certain areas that we have seen okay clear about the wetlands okay now so the we were having another term which was tiger reserve okay now see here 
Tiger Reserve is generally not a new area. Okay. It is not generally a new area. Suppose that a particular state is there and it is having within some of the protected area, it is having some population of tigers there. Okay. And it wants to protect that. Then it can submit or it can give a proposal for declaration of that area as a tiger reserve. Okay. This declaration can be done by the state government. State government can declare, but there is a condition. State government can declare, but there is a condition with approval of NTCA, National Tiger Conservation Authority. Okay. NTCA is a body which has been established under the provision of one act which we called as Wildlife Protection Act 1972. So this Tiger Reserve is also under the provision of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Okay. The NTCA can allow setting up of a Tiger Reserve and once it has allowed, once it has approved that, the state government can declare it. Okay. Of course, the NTCA is headed by the union government. Okay. So with the approval of the union government, the state government can declare a already protected area or a new area also as a tiger reserve. Okay. So many a times what happened that suppose there is a national park or a wildlife sanctuary, it is already protected having some viable number of tigers. They can again ask for declaration of that area as a tiger reserve. What is the benefit for them? That is the only benefit. Okay. If they are having declaration of a tiger reserve, they will get additional benefit from the union government under the project tiger. Okay. We have a project tiger which comes with some benefit. If an area has been declared as a tiger reserve, then obviously the state government will get some additional funds for protection of the entire habitat from the central government. Okay. So this is the one thing which is done in case of tiger reserve. Okay. Approval by NTCA is required. So a state government cannot declare it by themselves. Okay. Basically project tiger is a project of central government. So why would central government give fund to any state government without any inspection or anything? First of all, the NTCA will properly evaluate the proposal. It will take the ground report and on the basis of that, it can allow the state government to declare the area as a tiger reserve. Once it has been declared, then in that case, the state government will get additional funds. Yes. No, central government doesn't declare it. Central government approves the declaration of Tiger Reserve. Okay. So it is done by the state government, but it can be done on the basis of approval from NTCA. Okay. Clear. So ultimately, state central government is having this control. And why will not the state government declare it? They will get additional funds. So suppose you have already a protected area. You have declared it as a national park and you are saving tigers there. So do a little bit extra effort and you will get more money from the central government. Okay. So now the funds for saving the entire national park can be coming from the central government. Okay. So that's why there is this, this uh, thing happens. Okay. First of all, the state government will give their proposal, will give their intent that we want to declare this as a tiger reserve. It will be reviewed and if finalized, they can declare it. Clear? So this is one more protected areas. We have seen, first of all, what is national park. We have seen national park, wildlife sanctuary, biosphere reserve, community reserve, conservation reserve, sacred groves, Ramsar sites and tiger reserve. Okay. These are some sort of areas which are there and uh, which can be declared as a protected area. Sacred groves are not declared by us. It is simply done by the community. Here. Union government, here union government and a state, sorry, both union and a state, union and a state, union and a state. It can be done by state government also. Biosphere reserves can be declared by state government also, union government also. Okay. Community reserve and conservation reserve, only the state government. Sacred groves, no role. Ramsar site, international recognition is there. State government can declare an area as a wetland. National government can declare an area as a wetland. They have this uh, authority, but then, 
if an area is a wetland it can get international recognition by the ramsar site after after proper investigation and all other things okay then tiger reserve is something which is declared by the state government but then approved by the central government okay so these are the protected areas these are the areas of in situ conservation where we are conserving the ecosystem where we are conserving the biodiversity in its original location in all of these cases we have not transferred anything okay they are conserved within their ecosystem clear one more area is there which we call as biodiversity hotspot okay now what is these biodiversity hotspot basically the biodiversity hotspots represent less than 2.5% of total area of earth total area of earth and even in this very small area they consist of more than 50% of 50% of and 50% of vegetation and 43% of mammals okay so you can see this they are an area which is very small in comparison to the total area of earth they are a very small area just representing 2.5% of surface of earth having more than 50% of the vegetation and 43% of the mammals okay this is the huge biodiversity in that zone but that is one part at the same time these are threatened 70% threat okay the threat level is very high okay their approx the area is like 70% uh, of this area is already threatened like suppose if this is a country sorry if this is a country uh, let us say that if this is a country and uh, this is the biodiversity hotspot in that region around 70% of that area is already under some threat okay threat of extinction then only it will be counted as a biodiversity hotspot so the areas are there which are having huge amount of biodiversity but at the same time they are facing high level of threat these will be called as biodiversity hotspot now there is a criteria for their recognition there is a criteria for their recognition what is the criteria at least have 1500 endemic vascular plants that is one thing criteria they must have if we have to declare an area as a biodiversity hotspot they must have 1500 endemic vascular plants means the plants which are having well developed xylem and phloem okay xylem and phloem are tissues uh, like they helps in transportation of food and water okay so if they are having well developed xylem and phloem they will be called as vascular plants okay so 1500 endemic vascular plants endemic means which are found in only that area not anywhere else in the world so they must have 1500 endemic vascular plants and the area must be threatened by 70% or more okay the area must be facing the 70% of the area of that uh, hot spot must be threatened okay so they are facing a huge level of uh, threat many of them are in on the verge of extinction okay so this is the area which can be declared as a biodiversity hotspot in india we are having four biodiversity hotspot okay in india we are having four biodiversity hotspot one is the himalayas one is yes western ghat and sri lanka the second is western ghat and sri lanka see one more thing 
biodiversity hotspot is not defined according to the country boundary okay they are not designated in the boundaries of the country they are designated as areas of ecological importance okay so it will expand over one or more countries okay third one is indo burma so this is basically the northeastern part of our country okay and the fourth one is sunda land first of all we have the himalayas second is western ghat and sri lanka third is indo burma and the fourth is sunda land sunda land basically consist nicobar and indonesian islands nicobar is from india and you know java sumatra and other areas are from indonesia okay so this is sunda land it doesn't mean sundarban okay it is not part of sundarban it is simply nicobar and other regions okay so these are the four officially recognized like the government of india in its official uh, notification says that we have four biodiversity four areas which are biodiversity hotspots okay sometimes in some books you will find three are given the first three but four has also fourth one has also been notified by the government so we will consider the four one okay clear so these are also some areas which are important from the point of protection of biodiversity okay now this is protected areas this is how we conserve the biodiversity okay so in biodiversity and conservation first we have seen what is biodiversity the components variation then we have seen the role of biodiversity the threats to biodiversity and conservation in conservation we have seen in situ method ex situ method in in situ methods we have seen all the protected areas which are there national parks wildlife sanctuaries biosphere reserves community reserve conservation reserve tiger reserve ramsar sites and sacred groves so these are the important protected areas in our country the conservation reserves now in biodiversity itself we have to read some related topics and one is types of species types of species some of them are important from the point of conservation itself okay like umbrella species and flagship species umbrella species and flagship species okay see whenever we are talking about the term umbrella species it means we have taken a particular species and under the umbrella of the conservation of that particular organism we are saving all the related organism here like suppose that think about the project tiger project tiger when we are trying to protect a tiger you cannot protect a tiger by keeping it in a cage when you are going for in situ conservation what you will do you will protect the entire habitat you will protect the entire food chain for protecting a tiger you will have to protect the plants also you will have that is its habitat you will have to protect the deer also you will have to protect the cattle also okay and for their conservation you will have to protect various insects and other things also because the insects and other things will help in the pollination of the plants and the growth and development of plants so under the umbrella of protection of one single species you are protecting the entire biodiversity okay so name is of one organism but protection of entire biodiversity in name of one organism okay protection of entire biodiversity in name of one so that will be called as umbrella organism okay or umbrella species the second one is flagship species okay. now many a times the umbrella species are also flagship species but here you have to consider a difference okay flagship species are those species 
which are charismatic in nature, which can bring additional awareness among the people about conservation of biodiversity. Okay. Like suppose that when you are saying them that we have to conserve a earthworm, many of the people might not be interested. Okay. Many of the people might not be interested in conserving a earthworm or a small mosquitoes or a small insects. Okay. Suppose that you say that we have to conserve the algae here. People won't be interested. Okay. But when you say them that we have to conserve an elephant, people might be able to get or people might be able to give some funds. Okay. So here we are choosing those animals which are charismatic in nature. Charismatic in nature. And raise awareness raise awareness and fun. Okay. So we are taking those animals which are charismatic in nature which has a wider appeal among the people and there is a chance that we can help we can actually uh, make people more aware about biodiversity conservation and also getting more funds in the name of that organism so that will be called as a flagship species okay like you can talk about tigers you can talk about elephants you can talk about lions you can talk about the that uh, African uh, cheetah which has been reintroduced in the name of African cheetah if suppose tomorrow the government says that we have to get more African cheetah from Africa we have to import more of them and we need public donation for that people might be interested to give more money but let us say that tomorrow the government says takes a name of a takes a scientific name of some insect and says that this is very important for biodiversity of this particular region how many of you are able to give funds or willing to give funds there will be very few people okay so they can relate with african cheetah but they cannot relate with the small insects which might be playing a very important role there okay so that is something which we have to keep in mind while deciding the flagship species okay that it should be charismatic it should have wider appeal among the people so that people will be more aware about the conservation and will be more willing to give the funds also Biodiversity needs fund for its conservation. Okay. So that is something which is required. Okay. These two are from the protection or conservation type of conservation view. Then in the species category itself, we have to also see certain more organisms like one is indicated species, one is keystone species and then we have alien invasive species this alien invasive species we have also discussed previously also that the organisms which are introduced from the outside environment in any ecosystem okay and they have this potential to overcome or to defeat or to remove the already existing biodiversity they will be called as alien invasive species. Now see, alien doesn't mean it always has to come from another country. Okay. A species from the northeastern region of country can be an invasive species in the western Ghat region. Or a species from the western Ghat region can become an invasive species in the Himalayan ecosystem. Okay. So it is not that it will be just coming from another country itself. It can be coming from different type of ecosystem also. A organism which is very much prominent in uh, let us say not very much prominent uh, say, let us say that an organism is living in Rajasthan and Gujarat type of climatic condition and it has been reintroduced in West Bengal and Orissa okay. the climatic condition and ecosystems are quite different there okay. one is having semi evergreen type of forest another is having tropical deciduous type of forest dry deciduous to be more precise okay. So when you are moving a organism from a dry deciduous zone to a semi evergreen and let us suppose that it finds it favorable then it can become an invasive species in the other area. Okay. So it is not always that it will come from outside. Okay. It is simply that it is from a different ecosystem. Okay. So it is coming from different ecosystem not all the species will become invasive okay some of them will not be able, able to survive 
like you introduced the polar bears in Madhya Pradesh. They will not even survive for a week. Okay. They will not repopulate or increase their number. They won't be even able to survive. You introduce the penguins from uh, temperate or polar regions to India. They won't be able to survive in Madhya Pradesh, Orissa or Chhattisgarh or even Delhi or any other place. Okay. So all these species will not become invasive. Some of them might become invasive over some period of time. Okay. When they become invasive, they replace the traditional or the native species. Okay. They replace the native species. Okay. Generally, they have better reproductive rate If an organism is having high repopulating tendency, like suppose an organism is able to repopulate at a higher rate, if it is able to produce at a very fast rate, then it will be able to invade that area. So that is one such criteria behind the invasive species. Okay. Like we have seen African catfish was there, uh, parthenium is there, that is carrot grass, lantana camera is there. These all are examples of alien invasive species. Even water hyacinth is there. That is also a sort of invasive species itself. Okay. So these are all sort of alien invasive species. Okay. In the OTOPS, you will get multiple examples of alien invasive species. And in the updation classes also, we will talk about some of them which are there in the news in the last one year. Okay. So from the OTOPS, read the traditional ones, the examples of them. And in the updation classes, I will give you a list of few modes which has been there in the limelight in the last one and a half years. Okay. Then, the second one is keystone species. Okay. So, what exactly is keystone species? Those species which are key to the survival of biodiversity. Okay. It is as simple as that. It is key to the survival of biodiversity. Okay. It plays such an important role that the replacement or the extinction of that species will have an unparalleled okay, impact on the entire biodiversity on the entire ecosystem. Okay. Like suppose when you are removing a predator, let us say that in India we are having only one predator in the form of tiger and when you are removing the tiger from the forest ecosystem, the entire forest ecosystem won't be able to maintain the equilibrium. The number of herbivores will expand to such a huge number that there will be additional pressure on the forest ecosystem. Okay. So normally, they have a key role in ecosystem. Okay. Extinction of their extinction may result in, no, not may. Their extinction will result in disturbance of entire system. Okay. Their extinction will result in ex uh, their extinction will result in disturbance of entire ecosystem. Now, is there a fixed number or is there a fixed definition of keystone species or a fixed list? The answer is no. One organism can be acting as a keystone species in one area, but it, not, it may not be keystone species in another area. Take the example of African cheetah, which has been reintroduced in Kuno National Park. It may have been a keystone species in the original ecosystem in Namibia. But in case of India, in case of Kuno National Park, it cannot be a keystone species in the present time. Okay. Because even without the existence of African cheetah, Kuno National Park was existing. And it was like in a state of equilibrium. So the leopards or the other things which were there, tigers are also there, leopards and tigers which are there, they are acting as a keystone species there. But the African cheetah, it may have been a keystone species in its original habitat, but not a keystone species here. So that is something which you have to keep in mind. One keystone species will not be keystone species in all the ecosystem. Okay. Like let us say the coral reef, 
The coral reef are a keystone species in the coastal ecosystem because due to their existence, 25% of marine biodiversity is existing. Okay. So there they are a keystone species. But coral reef ecosystem cannot be a keystone species if you reintroduce them in mangrove ecosystem. Okay. Mangroves are keystone species only in deltaic region. They are not a keystone species in terrestrial ecosystem. Mangroves can survive in terrestrial ecosystem also. They can survive on land easily, very much well. Okay. But they won't be a keystone species there. They are a keystone species only in the deltaic region. So a species will be keystone depending on where they are existing and what role they are playing. Okay. It can be a small insect, it can be a large predator. Okay. So there is no such fixed number or no such fixed name. Generally, the predators are counted as keystone species, but then other butterflies are also keystone species. In the type, in suppose we are talking about value of flowers national park their butterflies and honeybee will be called as a keystone species. Okay. So according to different ecosystem, keystone species will be different. Clear? The third one, indicator species. When we are talking about indicator species, it simply means the species which by their presence or absence, abundance or reduction in number are telling us about the health of the ecosystem. So what they are doing, they are telling us about the health of ecosystem. How they are telling this? Presence, absence, abundance or reduction in population. There are certain species which by their presence, absence, abundance or reduction in population are telling us about the health of the ecosystem and they will be called as indicator species. Okay. So how, let us see, there is one organism which we call as lichens. Lichens are also basically a symbiotic association between algae and fungi. Okay. But lichens are a very important indicator of air pollution okay basically lichens take all their nutrients from the air the plants take their nutrient from the soil but the lichens take their nutrients from air carbon dioxide from the air nitrogen and other things they also take from the air how when there is acid when there is rainfall it will contain nitric acid okay and from there they are getting their nitrogen now, see one thing, nitrogen is naturally present in atmosphere, 78%, okay. But when sulfur is there in very high amount, then what will happen? Sulfuric acid will also be formed and in that case, the lichens numbers will be redu uh, reduced. It means their population will be reduced or they will be eliminated easily, okay. So if there is a high level of pollution in the air, it will also be reflected in the rainfall. You know that when you have high amount of sulfur dioxide in the air, it will come down in the form of rainfall. Okay. And when you are having this sulfuric acid led rainfall, then in that case, lichens won't be able to survive. Okay. So pollution level can be indicated by the presence, absence, abundance or reduction in population of lichens. Okay. If lichens are very much flourishing, it means air is pure. If their number is reducing, it means what is happening? the pollution is increasing. So they are also called as biomonitors or bioindicators. Okay. In various places in United States, lichens are used as a method of calculating air pollution. Okay. So there is one such thing, lichens. Then you have salmon fishes also, you have coral reef also. You know that coral reef are highly sensitive to pollution. So if the pollution is increasing, there will be coral bleaching. If coral bleaching is happening, you can understand that there is something bad with the health of aquatic ecosystem. Okay. So again, coral leaves can also indicate. Salmon fishes, if the water is polluted, they go away. Okay. They move to other areas. Okay. 
So there are multiple species which can tell us about the health of the ecosystem and they are called as indicator species. Okay. Clear? So these species are also there. Keystone species are there. Indicator species are there. Alien invasive species are there. Flagship species are there. And then we also have this umbrella species. Okay. One more thing. We have already seen that, but let us see here also. Endemic species. When we are talking about endemic species, it means they are predominantly found in in one region. This is also you can say that found naturally in one place only. Okay. Like when we are talking about Nilgiri tar, Nilgiri tar is found in the Western Ghat region only and that too precisely in the area of Nilgiri region. So that will be a endemic species of that area. When you talk about Western Ghats, you have around more than 50% of species which are found in Western Ghat region, they are endemic to that region. Means they are found only in that particular area, not anywhere else in the world. Okay. They are found in a particular area itself. Like Ibex or also called as Himalayan goat. Himalayan goat is found only in the Himalayan region. It is not found anywhere else in the world. So that is also a type of indicator species, sorry, endemic species found only in, this is also called as Himalayan gold. It is found only in a particular region of the world. That's why it will be called as endemic species. Okay. So these are some types of species that we have discussed. Tomorrow we will discuss about one such small topic which is uh, speciation and mass extinction. Okay. There are six different phases of mass extinction and then speciation is a process. Speciation is having three or four different types. Okay. But one is major one, the other one are just derivative of it. Okay. But we will see all of them at one point. We will compare each of them that what is the difference between them. We will see the different types of speciation and then we will discuss about this mass extinction. Okay. Then after this will be covered in a few uh, 10, 20, 30 minutes. And then after we will move to the next section that is pollution and environmental issues. Okay. So we will start that thing from tomorrow. Any questions? Ecoline. Ecoline huh. Eco is simply a gradation of or a change in the ecological characteristics of a zone. See. Suppose that here we are having A ecosystem and here we are B ecosystem. This is a zone of transition. This is our ecotone. Okay. So there is a term which is called as ecoline. Okay. Now what is ecoline? Let us say that this is ecosystem 1 and this is ecosystem 2. This is terrestrial ecosystem. This is aquatic ecosystem. Okay. So when you are moving from this zone to this zone along this area of ecotone, you will find that in the initial area, let us say that we have made five blocks of it or three different blocks of it. Let us say that we have made three blocks of it, okay, three areas. Okay. Here you will find that the first block which we are having, let us say that block one, this is block two and this is block three. Okay. So when you are in block one, you will find that there is more characteristics similar to this E1 and a little bit of E2. Okay. So it will be having like 70% criteria of E1 and 30% of E2. This zone, like when you are, suppose uh, you might have seen isobar zones are created, like a uh, pressure between different area. Similarly, this eco line is a gradient or eco line is simply a area which is having similar type of characteristics. Okay. 
So eco line here it means this block will have this characteristic 70% characteristics of E1, 30% of E2. When you come in the middle block, let us say that it is having 50-50, 50% characteristics of E1, 50% of E2. When you are further coming in this third block, you are finding that 70% of E2 and 30% of E1. Now these three areas which are having a definite type of characteristics, that is what we call as eco line. Okay. So eco line is a general change in the ecological characteristics of the ecotone region. Okay. So in one particular zone, we are having a particular type of ecosystem characteristics. As we move further, more mix will be coming. As we move towards the aquatic system, more of aquatic nature and less of terrestrial nature. Okay. So this is what be a general gradation of ecological characteristics. That is what you can call it. Gradation of ecological characteristics. Okay. Okay. Uh, questions are there. Uh, Aviral, can you be a little bit more precise that what if state opposed center notification? See, uh, I think you have asked about national park and wildlife sanctuary that suppose if state government is not happy and it doesn't want the national government or the union government to declare an area as a national park. See, in that case, under our system, under our this uh, system of uh, federalism, you know that union government is having more power. It can take the land of the state government at any moment of time. Okay. So it has that power to take the land. The state government cannot refuse it in that manner. Of course, it can oppose it, but then there will be discussion and deliberation. And if the central government wants it, it will take it. Okay. And in the law itself, it is given that the central government will consult with the state government, but it is having the power to declare it. So they will take the land. What is the role of tribal people in national park and in wildlife sanctuary? See, in case of national park, the tribal people are not such allowed to live within the national park. What happens that when we are declaring an area as a national park, the people who are living there, they are asked to relocate to the adjoining regions. And for that, they are given fair compensation. Okay. Many a times court cases and other things are there. But in general, within a national park or wildlife sanctuary, Human settlements are not allowed. Whenever such an area is crafted or carved out of a forest zone, the tribal people are asked to simply relocate to some other places. They are given fair compensation. They are given fair amount of land also in that case. Tourism is allowed in national park also. Tourism is allowed in wildlife sanctuary also, in biosphere reserves also. So in all cases, tourism is allowed. Uh, Supreme Court has ordered buffer zone only in biosphere reserve or all national park and wildlife sanctuary. See, Supreme Court has not talked about buffer zone as such. Supreme Court has talked about the core zone. Okay. They have asked that in all the protected areas such as national park, wildlife sanctuaries or biosphere reserves, you must have a core zone and that core zone should not be influenced at all. Okay. So this is one thing which has been ordered by the Supreme Court that even within a national park, you should have a core zone and in that core zone, there should be no interference, no tourism activities or no any other activities should be allowed within that core zone. So they have given about this core zone thing in particular. Uh, sir, if national park are therefore conserving, then what is the need of wildlife century as they are both for conserving flora and fauna? Now see this. Wildlife sanctuary is uh, generally when we are declaring this wildlife sanctuary, those areas are first located, which are having not too much huge biodiversity. And at the same time, a large number of people are also living there. Okay. Or if not living, they are going into that area on a regular basis. Let us suppose that this is our entire forest zone. And this is a part we want to declare as a protected area. Let us say that we want to declare it as a protected area. And let us imagine that tribal people are living here and there. And 
they are also utilizing this forest area for grazing and collecting minor forest produce and there is a regular movement plus this area is not like having huge biodiversity or uh, greater biodiversity which needs to be protected in very uh, which needs to be protected in a very strict sense in that case what we are doing we are basically conserving this area as in a slightly lesser amount or in a slightly lesser degree okay so this is when we conserve we declare it as a wildlife sanctuary okay this is where we declare it as a wildlife sanctuary and if we need greater amount of protection later on we can even convert it into a national park sacred groves may have customary laws and there is a provision that communities can follow customary laws so technically can we say that there are no laws see no uh, for sacred groves there is no such uh, law it's in that sense it's not that uh, like uh, you have made a law and uh, you have to follow that in each and every of uh, this uh, sacred groves there is no such law regulating them there is simply a traditional belief system that is responsible for safeguarding that ecosystem so this is what we do in case of sacred groves wetland can be an eco tone how see if you see wetland wetland is neither a completely terrestrial zone nor a complete aquatic zone it is having a mix of both terrestrial and aquatic ecosystem influences when you see a typical wetland you will find that it has characteristics of both of them okay so that's why we call them as a eco tone difference between wetlands and lakes now see if you go by ramsar definition even the lakes and ponds are counted as a proper wetland okay but generally if you see in conventional sense if you see in conventional sense lakes are generally the areas which are having water in a you can say that which are having very deep water having very little influences of land or any other area but there is no technical definition okay like you can see there is a bhoj lake or a sukhna lake in chandigarh now traditionally they are lake but according to ramsar definition even all the lakes are wetlands okay so in that sense if you look at the broader connotation lakes will be a part of wetland structure itself but uh, wetlands are of different types wetlands can have even like a larger area exposed to land and lesser area exposed to water but in case of lake what we see there is a larger area which is under the water and very few of them are exposed to this land ecosystem so there is no such technical definition or technical thing defining or uh, like uh, you can say that uh, there is no such technical definition separating them if you go by ramsar definition all the ponds even though they are counting rivers as the wetlands the river channels or streams are also counted as part of wetland so there you will have no such distinction between them what is the dominant producer of wetland now see wetlands are of different types and in each of them it will vary like in a wetland which is having the mangrove vegetation mangroves will be the dominant producer in case of uh, areas where you have little amount of water and it is a so, sort of a, uh, you can say that pitland okay there you have aquatic organisms uh, aquatic floating algae or water hyacinths which will be major producer okay in case of paddy fields which is again counted as a wetland you will have paddy crops as the major producer so it depends on all the different types of ecosystem it cannot be same for all see look at the broader connotation of the wetland okay if you go by that broader connotation there is multiple types of wetlands and each of them would have different types of organism details of ramsar 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 is a convention okay uh, in the convention and protocol section we will again talk about this ramsar ramsar is basically a international convention for the protection of wetlands it is it is concentrated or it is focused on conservation of wetlands of the entire world okay and it it you can say that advocates the different countries to declare such an area declare areas as ecologically important or declare some areas which are of ecological importance to be a protected area offer their greater protection and then it also gives them international recognition okay so it is like a advocating thing it is not a law or it is not such a like a, 
a thing which dictates the policy of the country but it advocates and it promotes that the countries follow the Ramsar convention and its policy suggestion. So it is an advocating thing rather than pressurizing thing or rather than a, a convention which actually forces it. When we will discuss this convention and other parts, we will again come back to Ramsar convention. How does wetland of international importance is brought under the Montrex record? See, when a wetland is threatened to a very high level degree, then the, Rams, the authorities of the Ramsar, they are evaluating the different uh, Ramsar sites. And if a particular Ramsar site is not given a very high level of protection, then it is brought under the Montrex record. What is the criteria that any wetland is considered as a Ramsar site? We will come to that portion. When we will discuss about this Ramsar convention, we will see all the criteria and other things. What is the benefit of getting our biosphere reserves recognized under Man and Biosphere Program of UNESCO? Do we get funds for its conservation? Now see, directly from UNESCO, it is not such recognition will necessarily uh, mean that you will get fund for conservation. But when you have bios, uh, when you have your biosphere listed on the UNESCO network, then first of all, it will be good from tourism point of view because people will first search that what are the important biosphere reserves those who are looking for nature based tourism they will find it first second thing is when you are having a biosphere reserve under unesco recognized system then it is easier to get funds from other donors like there are various ngos and other organizations even uh, international organizations which are giving fund for conservation of biodiversity so when you have a unesco recognized biosphere then you will get more funds eco-sensitive zones in in-situ conservation. See, eco-sensitive zone simply means like uh, when we are talking about this uh, Himalayan ecosystem or when we are talking about Western Ghat ecosystem, eco-sensitive zones means those areas which can be impacted on a very large scale due to outside influences. Okay, Like uh, you might have been aware about this uh, right now a problem is going on. Josie Mutt is an area and in that you can see that this area is basically built on a previously existing landslide zone and now the pressure on that land has increased to a very high level a very high level and due to again the houses which are there or the area the different structures which are there they are also threatened now okay so this is a eco sensitive zone you cannot have un uh, you can say that you cannot have uncontrolled activities there. You cannot have many activities which go simultaneously at that place. It becomes difficult for sustenance of the entire area. Okay. So for that particular reason, eco-sensitive zones means the one which can have a large impact even with slightly lesser or even with a little bit influence from the outside, mostly the anthropogenic ones. So Tiger Reserve is same as National Park or Wildlife Sanctuary. See, Tiger Reserve is a, uh, like uh, you can say that it is not an area in such, like uh, once you can simply declare a Tiger Reserve. Tiger Reserve is a, uh, you can say that a protection mechanism which has been established. Okay. Of course, it will have its area and other things. Uh, there will be proper designation and all. But Tiger Reserve is a sort of project based thing. Okay. Like when you have a already protected area and the state government is looking for the protection of tigers there and they are doing a very good effort then they can ask the NTC that we are already conserving the tiger we have a sustainable population of tiger if you declare this area as a tiger reserve then and if you give us funds then there can be better protection of the tigers here and for that purpose the existing national parks or wildlife centuries can be declared as a tiger reserve so when they are declared as a tiger reserve it doesn't mean the wildlife centuries will now not be counted as a wildlife century within that wildlife centuries or by mixing two or three wildlife centuries we can carve out a tiger reserve so tiger reserve is an area where the tiger is simply moving let us say that we have this entire area and here we are having three different wildlife centuries okay so a tiger reserve can be like this place here it can be a tiger reserve as such okay so tiger reserve is the habitat range of that tiger and if the state government is already working on its conservation, it can appeal to the NTCA that we are willing to declare this as area as a tiger reserve. Okay, we will offer greater protection to the tigers here. Okay, 
and for that they can get some additional funds from the union government under the project tiger then uh, if mangroves can live in fresh water why they are found in swampy saline areas and why they are not found generally in mainly fresh water bodies ha huh. this is a good question like when you are talking about the mangroves they are found in deltaic region because in that condition no other terrestrial plants can survive the terrestrial plants like mahogany shisham or any other plants cannot survive in that area so mangroves are not facing competition there but when they are living in terrestrial ecosystem or fresh water ecosystem they find tough competition from other species and in comparison to other species they are not able to survive there okay so in the land based ecosystem due to competition they are eliminated but in the deltaic region due to their special feature only they are able to survive the other terrestrial plants are not able to survive there what is new metaphor in mangroves new metaphors are simply the outgrowth of roots that we have discussed earlier also new metaphors are simply the outgrowth of root you know that the entire area is submerged so the roots are not getting any oxygen supply in the case of submerged water the oxygen is very low and they are not getting oxygen so the roots are coming out from the water they are getting exposed to the atmosphere and from there they are taking in the oxygen so these roots are called as new metaphors uh, i have told it last day also uh, perhaps you were not there i have told you the sources of environment also last day there is another question what about supreme court told eco sensitive zone and around buffer zone up to 1 km see uh, we will discuss that thing in current affairs also it varies according to different areas the different things which are there in current affairs right now we will discuss it at once that what are the new rules and regulations about national parks or other things supreme court has said that um, in each of these areas there must be construction of a core zone but in many of it it has not been done there is also some update about forest right act okay so we will all see it all together okay no they have itself found their habitat uh, mangroves have found their habitat themselves we have not introduced them mangroves have been existing for a very long time you know that the seeds of the plants they start moving to different areas like uh, suppose if they were uh, previously existing in terrestrial ecosystem the birds and other agents which are there they are also responsible for dispersal of seeds towards different areas and due to the dispersal of seeds they will go to different portions and some of them went to mangrove areas also in a very slow and gradual process so we have not introduced them it has been done ecologically only is that clear we have not introduced uh, mangroves okay uh any other question okay so thank you everyone and let's meet uh, tomorrow and then we will discuss the remaining things thank you very much thank you everyone